Uh, we have uh, the pleasure of having a very special person before we begin this uh, Q&A uh, with us today. Uh, I call him one of the walking angels on earth, Jim Murray. Jimmy's with us. For the one or two people in the room who may not know, was right there at the beginning of uh, the Ronald McDonald House, and he's always there when there's a charity uh, in need. And as I said, uh, he's already doing God's work on, on earth. So, Jimmy, it's great to see you. It's always great to see you. And uh, you've guaranteed a win on Saturday night, I heard? Absolutely. Okay. That's perfect. Well, we have uh, some wonderful people we're going to introduce, and, and we're going to talk sports because this is a sports luncheon, apparently. But let me start with uh, Jeff Ash. He may have seniority on all of us. I don't know. Uh, Philadelphia Media, 45 years. A sports anchor, sports reporter, news anchor for 24 of those years at KYW. Right? So let's bring Jeff up now. Jeff, come on up. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's even got his own walk-up music. Isn't that special? You, you, hi. We just talked for 30 minutes. You don't need to shake my hand. Just sit down. All right, let's, uh, let's welcome a man who... We're, this is like the old people's table for us. We have somebody who's not an old people. And uh, he, he is, uh, well, actually, we had a couple people who are not old people. But I'll start with Joe Fordyce, who is a senior producer at NBC Sports Philadelphia, primarily with Flyers, uh, Flyers talk, podcast, sports producing all over the place. And you come on up, please, if you would. Uh, Joe? And we also see him at the ballpark. And we always love it when he comes in. Oh, you've got Kenny G as your walk-up music? That's, that's good. I can't wait to see what some of our other walk-up music will be. All right. Jimmy, can you come up? I gave you a nice little introduction first, but I'd love to have you come and join us. Because this guy, former general manager, filled up Jaws. Oh, I get it. Ronnie J. I know. Perfect. Here's my friend. This guy. I will. You okay? Oh, boy. Uh, by the way, general manager of the of your Philadelphia Eagles when Dick Vermeil's team uh, went to the Super Bowl and uh, a real treasure in our city. Uh, also, like to uh, welcome Deuces Rogers from the Action News team. Prior to joining Action News, Deuce has spent several years. Just, what do we have for music? Oh, I like that. Your Chicago Bulls, uh, and uh, is is just. You know, first class if you watch Action News. Uh, before that, uh, he worked at ESPN, Outside the Lines, and before ESPN, he worked for WCBS in New York as sports director. And uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Bill Vargas, former sports anchor on WCAU, WHYY, and Fox 29. What is that? That's pretty nice. Well, this is interesting. We've run out of chairs before we ran out of guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's the first time this has ever happened. But uh, Lou, Lou Tilly, everybody. No, 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 no. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Come over here and sit down, please. Lou Tilly, ladies and gentlemen, from CBS3 and, and China. Man worked in China. There you go. There you go. Well, we're here to, uh, to kind of, I guess, BS a little bit, and then uh, obviously, uh, you know, recall the old times and talk about the new times, present day, and also to answer any questions that that you might have. Uh, this is uh, it's a pretty cool time in this city when we have teams uh, that are all playing well. Uh, the Sixers, you know, you never know. I think they're going to really put a run on soon. Uh, they're playing really well anyway. Flyers seem to have gotten it together. Uh, our ball club's getting ready to go to spring training with some some new talent. And we have the birds for a Saturday uh, late game. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, with Deuces uh, about the birds and something we ask you at the table here. Uh, are we okay or should we? is there reason to worry about the Giants? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. First of all, thank you for uh, inviting me here. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and seeing some, uh, some familiar faces and some new faces. Uh, the Eagles. I'm optimistic, but I've been. You're in praying. You yeah, have your well, hands in a well, praying position. I've been here. I've been in town a little more than ten years, and I, I know, I know enough to be cautiously optimistic. Don't put my heart completely out there, okay? Because sometimes it gets trampled on. Yeah, it um, happens. The eagle. If as long as Jalen Hurts is 75, 80 percent, 
Uh, they should easily win this game. We mm-hmm. just don't know really how, how banged up that shoulder is. Um, when he first got hurt in that Chicago game, oh, he might be back in a game. He might be back in two games. I think that was all – We I mean, that was that was BS. He mm-hmm. was more hurt than they let on. Um, but as long as he, – he's supposed to practice later on today. Uh, not supposed to be limited. So we'll see how he comes out of practice today. It's not so much how, how he practices. It's how he feels the next day. Mm-hmm. And so as long as he's okay, I'm okay thinking they're, they're going to win. Um I don't want to. I don't even want to think about what happens if if they lose this game. It's no. just going to be a lot no. of finger pointing. Uh, a great you know thirteen win season down the drain. Um, so what? I'm optimistic. We'll I'd think say, positively. Yes, right? we and I will keep praying. Yeah, Jimmy. Uh, when I see quarterbacks, penalties on quarterback, penalties on defensive players who touch the quarterback the wrong way, and the flag comes out. I, I think of the music that you walked up to, Ron Jaworski. Got killed when he played. Mike Hartenstein, right? right? Pretty much, you know, buried him in the in the ground. Um, is this the same game as it was when when you were involved in it, Jimmy? Well, I think it's the same game, but it's uh, progressed to the point where the world stops to see the Eagles play. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really amazing. Everybody's life is going to be affected by the outcome of the game. Right. I mean, that's a powerful, powerful thing. But uh, for a little dead ender from Brooklyn Street in West Philly to be in charge of blame, you know, we didn't win our <laughs> Super Bowl. But uh, when I was there, but I, I think it's, you can feel it in the air. You can feel it in this room, certainly with all the people here that are in love with sports and have made their living off it. Uh, I, I just think uh, there, there won't be anything to do at 8 o'clock except watch the game. Yeah, It'll roads be a, will be empty. In the Catholic Church, Stores it would be, be a open. holy game of obligation. Whether you like it, whether you're not, <laughs> whether your kids like it, whether your wife likes it, this is what we're doing. And uh, and it's exciting. Uh, I was around when the Super Bowl started, and uh, we got in one. We didn't win it. But uh, it's changed the world. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and to be playing the Giants for the third time, I love all that stuff. Uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. So uh, we're lucky. We're a team that has a chance. But you don't have a chance unless you win them all to get there. It's true. And then after you get there. So it's it's become, uh, you know, I remember P. Rozelle when we started this uh, Super Bowl. Yeah, hey, what's this? And it's become a household word. Everybody knows what it is. And everybody's going to have their emotions on one team. And in this room, we know what that team is. Absolutely. <laughs> Something else has changed over the years is um, Comcast Sportsnet. And, Joe, you guys, obviously, you're not doing quite as much coverage as you were at one point. It kind of narrowed it down a little bit. But to have the freedom that you guys have to be right across the street and have people devoted to it, uh, you, you kind of got to step up on, on the 3, 6, and, and 10 now, I, I, I think, with the, way it's, with the way it is. Can you yeah, talk about um, that? There's Over the years, I've been there you know, uh, next month. It'll be 20 years. I mm-hmm. uh, started at Comcast Sportsnet, now NBC Sports Philly. And, there was a couple times over those years where the prospect of moving the station, whether it be downtown to the uh, the Comcat, one of the towers, or somewhere else, came up, and the sentiment was, "Why would we do that? Where we can walk to any of the, right. you know, to get any access, whether it be practice, games, whatever the case may be." But yeah, so we are uh, anything that happens, we're right there. Um, around the time when I interned before I was working there was the Allen Iverson practice press conference, which oh yeah, uh, kind of began and word started to trickle up, and then all the resources went downstairs because it was literally at the bottom of the steps and right outside of our control room where that happened. And um, you just can't beat that. I mean, that's no, that's um, talk the about epicenter practice. of everything practice. that goes on. Yeah, Here practice. we are talking about practice. not a game, not a game. Practice. That's right. So it has changed. And, and Bill, you've been around the block to, to a couple of stations. Uh, how do you think the business has changed since you were uh, a young pup coming in? Oh, wow. Um, well, we were just talking at the table about right. how everybody's saving money and you guys are down to. Although, actually, there was a time when Jeff Ash and I used to trade off at Channel 10 every weekend so they wouldn't have to pay me benefits, full-time benefits. Really? Jeff was a producer, so they put him on the air every other weekend. 
because I was working at Channel 12 and I got that amazing call. You just pick up the phone and somebody says, hey, Bill, this is Paul Gluck, uh, news director at Channel 10, and uh, I've seen you on Channel 12. I'd like you to come on over and maybe do our weekend anchoring for us, you know, because Al Meltzer had semi-retired and mm -hmm. they took Ron Burke off weekends and put him on during the week. Right. So weekends were open, and but they wouldn't <laughs> let me be full-time. <laughs> full time yeah. so they wouldn't have to pay me benefits. So it's, it's always kind of been like that. Um, but I did want to make a comment about this panel because, you know, uh, some of these guys haven't been here before. Jim is always there. Jeff is usually there. But I used to enjoy coming back to having the same guys who know it alls on this panel so I could say, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, certain individuals whose names I won't mention, I told you so. And I would have been saying that about Jalen Hurts because Jalen Hurts, you know, people said he didn't have, he didn't have an arm, this, yeah. that, and the third. When you got a guy who's 23 years old and has the work ethic and the desire that this kid has, you know he's going to get better, or you mm -hmm. should know. And I don't know why so many Eagles fans were down on him because when a kid has that attitude, you know he's going to work his butt off and get better and better. To just to add on that, sure. we. You often hear about guys, oh, he's the first guy in, he's the last guy out of practice. With, with Hertz, it legit is yeah. true. He's the first guy in the building, you know, five, sometimes 5 o'clock in the morning before the coaches get there or, the, or maybe the coaches slept yeah. there the night before, but he's also the last guy to leave. It's every single day, and I've heard it from many people inside the building. The, his work ethic is unbelievable. And one thing that I've noticed about Hertz, if you listen to locker room interviews – during the week or after the game, you'll notice that a lot of the players, including a lot of the veteran players, echo the same thing that Hurt says. He is setting the tone. He's the leader. And it's, it's, it's odd. You mentioned his age. He's, he's, in his, mm -hmm. he's in young 20s. But they look at him as he's the guy and he sets the tone. And I find it amazing that someone that young came in, could command the locker room and command the respect of his peers, and he's getting the job done. Yeah. Do you know a, a lot of uh... – a lot of players go outside and they, they try to find a media consultant to help them. He has a full-time guy who also works with the NFL, works with him, because he wants to be better in front of the media. He wants to tell them things, but not so much that right. he gets in trouble. Uh, so, and a guy that, that pays that much attention to detail, you know he's going to be good. Lou, you were in China for how many years? Nine? Ten? Ten? Uh, better part, better part of six years. Six, okay. Yeah. And you were doing arena football there. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the? I just ask you, what's a sure. Chinese football fan like? <laughs> well, they're bigger than you think, and I, not to generalize, but that's the first question I usually get because we we uh, we spent four years developing Chinese college rugby players into football players. Mm. <clears throat> this was done in concert with Dick Vermeil and Ron Jaworski, of course, who was so heavily involved with the Arena League in Philadelphia for so long. And since I stepped away from CN8, the old Comcast network, I've been in private business, and I was the producer of the Soul, and then for the Arena Football League in general. That's how I got to, to know Ron, and we took it over to China. And, and it was a real challenge and the hardest thing that I've ever tried to do in my life. But the primary thing in, in, in the business world of media is to educate, entertain, and engage mm -hmm. the, the three E's. And the hardest part for us was to educate the, the Chinese people on this completely foreign sport to them. What the world doesn't understand about our sport of football is why it stops. Every other sport that they follow, mm -hmm. rugby and soccer, is constantly in motion. Why does it stop? So my job was to explain to the Chinese, who are very smart and interesting people, th that there was planning that goes into every single play. It's not just run out there and see what happens. That they found fascinating. And in, in short order, we only had one season, Scott. We played in eight arenas all around China. But we averaged 8,000 paying fans per game, which, pretty good. which was pretty good. Before yeah. it all fell apart for financial reasons, and doing business in China is very hard. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the hardest thing was educating them. We did entertain them, and we did not finish the enterprise. Yeah, you could have told the Chinese it's, it's, it's our sport. It's our beloved sport, football, because it's long meetings followed by short bursts of violence. That's yeah. <laughs> where we seem to be in our country right now. It's the only political how, statement I'll make. How, how, how's your Mandarin, Lou? That's what I want. Oh, it's terrible. No. It's terrible. The only thing I remember explicitly is gumbe, and that is the official salute of our business meetings in China. And there were a lot well, of that's those. that's a good thing to know. It was a good thing, a good to, thing to start on. Can Jeff, I just quickly acknowledge sure, that my wife, Sue Serio from Fox 29, just came in. Hey, honey. Ah, oh, hi, Sue. How are you? Uh, 
they have, they, they're shooting a weather special, so that's why she's just getting here. But, uh, we all know in sports how weather has taken over. It's not your fault. We're happy for you, Sue. <laughs> we used to, at Channel 6, have a really nice office with a window, uh, and weather was basically in a, in a big closet. And they kept hiring new weather people and kept letting sports people go, and eventually <laughs> took our office. It was a land grab, basically. <laughs> But that's what's happened in, in television news now. Every, everything is, is the weather. Not what it was when you were working with Al Meltzer. Hello there. Hello there. Fun, uh, fun times, huh, back then? Before, there was only three of us. Before I answer that question, how long has it been since Lou was in Wuhan? <laughs> <laughs> I came back in 2017, oh, okay. so I'm All off right. the okay. okay, good. I'm glad I'm not sitting near him. Yeah. Um, uh, Boy, it, it really is, has changed over the, <laughs> over the last 30 years. Um, it, it, it used to be more fun because we had more access to the players and coaches than we yeah. do now. Correct. And s since we're the conduit between the fans and the players and coaches, we could tell them more about mm -hmm. the players and the coaches. Now, you can't get within 100 yards of Jalen Hurts. Um, Back in the 1990s, we were talking about this earlier, at Westchester, when the Eagles would practice, uh, we'd go have lunch with them in the, yeah. in the cafeteria. So we had access, and we knew more about the players and coaches, and we had relationships. Now it's a lot harder. No, it's true. I remember sitting down um, at, a, at a hotel before they had a, the team all had the same meal, and uh, Stan Walters sat down. Stan's a wonderful guy, offensive lineman, big guy. And he lights up a cigarette. And I said, Stan, you're a professional athlete. How can you smoke? He takes a piece of paper and he draws a line down the middle. And then he draws another line about five yards back and another line five yards forward. He said, when you're an offensive lineman, that's all you do. Most I can move is five, years. I, five yards. I like to move forward. Sometimes I'm pass blocking. I, I, he said, the worst thing for me is when the quarterback completes a 75-yard pass. I got to get all the way down to the other end of the field. <laughs> then it's a little tough with smoking, but everything is everything has changed. We we had most of us three, six, and ten, and uh, two, and sometimes three newspapers. That was it, right? Now everybody who can get a press pass comes with this, right? <laughs> and they have every bit of information. It seems like because. I'm not saying that all of it's correct, mind you, because we do have the Twitter world one, and there's a, sometimes a strange degree of accuracy or inaccuracy. But Deuce says you're you're up, you're up against how many people are in the Eagles locker room now uh, on a week? It seems like it seems like everybody has a press pass. It's <laughs> um, it's 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 borderline ridiculous. You know, back in the day when I I started doing TV on air '94. Um, you, you, you had a couple cameras and you, you had newspaper writers. Right. Now there's a lot more people, and you said they have got their cell phones. You don't know who they're working for. Um, but you're right about the access. It's it's a lot. It's a lot different. Um, Plus, you have John Q. Public who has a phone, and right. if they see Jalen Hurts at a Wawa, right? They're, they're going right. to they're they're yeah, their so, own interview. So they're going to beat you to a story. Right. What, what, during the the pandemic, um, Zoom became the way to do all these interviews, and it became really hard for. Everybody, the beat writers especially. Um, the beat writers, you know, the, the newspaper guys and women, they get a lot of their information by being in the clubhouse. They might see something, pull a guy aside, pull a coach aside, pull a trainer aside. With the whole Zoom interviews, it was, it was virtually impossible. Yeah. Um, and I was really afraid that, because the NFL, out of all the leagues, the NFL is the one that wants to control their product the most. I was, I was shocked they even let us back in the, in the locker rooms. I thought... You know, Goodell was going to be like, it's Zoom from now on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even the Eagles, you know, a couple days a week, uh, Sirianni will do his press conference via Zoom still, like on a Monday or a Tuesday. He'll mm -hmm. do it via Zoom. And then with the Zoom, it's, you know, you might get a question in. Um, you might not. You they might, might not. not call. And then right. if you ask a question, and a lot of what we do, it's not just a question. It's the follow-up question. Mm -hmm. like, like in hockey, it's not the they shot. Give, they don't give you follow-ups. Yeah. You just go it's on. It's not the shot. It's the rebound. You know, you're trying to get that follow-up. <laughs> right. And you don't get the, you know, get it. And if your question's not asked, you're, you're SOL unless you yeah. can text a player or text a coach and maybe get that information you can. So it's, it's, it certainly has changed a lot. It's made it a lot uh, more difficult to get the little nuggets right. that we used to get. Jimmy, the, the yeah, uh, I'm please. I'm sorry. Yeah, when go I, ahead, when I started out <clears throat> When I started out at Fox 29 back in um, – 97, my whole thing was I wanted to get 
the players to do like some fun off the wall stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, and they were always available and willing. I did one. Bobby Hoying was going to be the quarterback of the future for the Eagles at that time, <clears throat> so we seven. did. It. Huh? He wore number seven. Yeah. That never went over well with Charles. <laughs> oh, I gotcha. Yeah. So um, I did this, and it was the piece was called Billy V Show Me, and we would take a football term and then have the player act it out with me. So. The term was going to be <clears throat> naked bootleg. <clears throat> so I take Bobby Hoying, we go into the bubble, the practice center indoor, and I pretty much took off all my clothes, except for a big boot. <clears throat> and, then <laughs> and, we were, and we're walking around, and then I say, so is this what a naked bootleg is? Oh, no. Oh, my. <laughs> so then... <laughs> Oh my! Did you guys? So then, did you guys have a boss? <laughs> Whose idea was this? And I'm thinking, if if, if Andy Reid or uh, I think it might have been Ray Rose at that time, but whomever or any you know anybody from the Eagles came in, I would have been you yeah. know that would not have. Been. <laughs> but you know we have. Is this now. is this right before the time you went from WCAU to WHYY? Was <laughs> <laughs> right about that same time? Maybe you needed to no, find no, another no, home. No, this was uh, actually Sue and I were coming from Buffalo to start back here in Philly at, at that? Fox 29. That's yeah. one of the things that I did. But we'd have a different player every week doing wacky stuff. And yeah. you had that kind of access. And you they had were freedom. willing to. And you had time. Yeah. You had time. Jimmy, the, I'll never forget how well the Eagles treated us when, when I first came to Philly in 81. Uh, for the news conference on Monday with Dick, uh, we would go to the, uh, the dining room, the media dining room. And you guys would feed us steak every Monday. Deuces, they would put out sirloin, right? I mean, they would Locks have on Sunday mornings. It's Locks called on Sunday Life morning. with Leonard. Leonard, Leonard Toes. Everything was former first Eagle. class. I mean, and we appreciated everybody in this room and all the people who aren't here. I mean, it really was a perfect marriage, Philly, Eagles, mm -hmm. sports. I mean, every one of us sitting up here has had the privilege of being inside the castle. Most of the stories will never come up, but the good stories and the way the fans, the people of Delaware Valley, are affected by how a team wins yeah. or loses. Right. It's not just ordinary. It's mm -hmm. an extraordinary. And to be in Philly, the way the thing has progressed, it's only how they do this weekend and the following weekends, right. because they will go from the top of the mountain to who screwed it up? <laughs> I was at a lot of times, and uh, you know we're, we're blessed. Look at look around this room. Look around this organization. Jackie, who uh, brought us all together over here. Uh, this is Philly. It's hard to explain it. I love when you introduced everybody. How many years they've been here, having fun, yeah. and getting paid for doing sports. Jim, tell them how you got from you to come here. That was hard. Uh, we were seeing three Sorry. other guys. Sorry. Leonard Thank never you. stopped. Anywhere but Vegas before we were going to LA to interview with three prospects. And I was watching the TV in the Rose Bowl, and Woody Hayes got upset by Dick Vermeil. And I said, This guy. So I called him. And the call lasted, lasted more than I've just talked. Hey, yeah, thanks, Jimmy. I appreciate it. Bye. I said, Well, at least I tried. Five minutes later, I'll be right over. So we're staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Leonard stayed there, even though we're going to L.A. It cost more than my neighborhood. And, uh, you know, it, it was a perfect marriage. Yeah. And he was over our house this week. Diane and I sat there and talked to him for an hour and a half. And uh, he became Philly. Yeah. The fact that he did the full circle, made an impression, won the games, and won everybody's hearts. That's what yep. sports is about. And didn't you tell him to come here because of the city? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, Philly, I'm you, a little yeah. Brooklyn Street guy. Yeah. I'm a neighborhood guy. I mean, when you try to explain Philly to other people, they... And, uh, to pick up on that theme, um, I've been out of the active business for a while, but three times in the last five years, I've had charities that I still work for, one of which is the prostate cancer uh, thing mm -hmm. that still honors Gary Papa. Three times I've asked Dick to come out and host special events privately to raise money, not just the event itself. Yeah. And three times he said yes. Yeah. Doesn't surprise you. See, that, that, that's where Philly's different. And I've worked in Boston, Baltimore, Washington, New York. People think they're similar. They're not. This, this, this one is it's just different. Hey, you know, everybody in this room has been affected by that. Yeah. Because people aren't saying, well, I can't talk to you. I'm making a million dollars a week or whatever they make now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people really get to know each other. All of us up here, we've all been blessed 
to be involved with not just the Eagles. The Phillies right now got everybody excited. The Flyers came back after getting beat. I mean, everybody's in sports here. Bill Giles never said no. No, he didn't. Yeah. We, we've been fortunate. J uh, Jimmy, you know, there was a time when uh, it almost became the uh, Phoenix Eagles or Arizona Eagles. <laughs> oh, yeah. When Leonard more. decided he was going to hop on a plane and yeah. go to Miami and, and not answer any questions, but meanwhile, work to maybe sell the team. Yeah, no, what was there, that like? there, there is a lot of stories. I wrote a book called Life's an Audible, and, hmm. but it's mostly about the Ronald McDonald House and the power of sport for good. But. Uh, the stakes are high. Yeah. I mean, what these teams cost now, Leonard put it for a handshake, you know. Right. But I remember I, the, the story I have from that is, is I came into work and they said, you're, you're on a plane to uh, Phoenix to follow the story. And, of course, Leonard's not in Phoenix, so there's not much of a story there. We yeah. talked to Jerry Colangelo, owner of the Suns, which was the only team, professional team there. So they've then they found out Leonard was in Miami, so they flew me straight to Miami. And I kept calling Leonard's room for a, for an interview, and he would just hang up on me. Yeah. And, and I always like Leonard, not the nice oh, man, but he didn't want to talk. He didn't want to talk. Yeah. It was clear he didn't want to talk. So I called the station. I said, I'm coming home tomorrow morning. I can't get this interview. And I said, try one more time. So I went down to the lobby, and, and this is before cell phones or anything. Remember how they had those little, like, bird holes, whatever? And wherever your room was, there yeah. was a place to put the mail or, or, or messages. So I looked, I knew he was on the top floor because Leonard would never be on anything but the top floor. <laughs> and I saw one of the rooms, you know, cutouts, had, was jammed with paper. Well, it's got to be Leonard's room. Yeah. So I looked at the room number, took the elevator up, knocked on the door. The maid answers it. I hear Leonard, I'm not talking to anybody. So then I call, I call the guy, I'm on my way. Five minutes later, I get a phone call in my room. Scott Leonard Toes, T-O-S-E of the Philadelphia Eagles. That's why I said that. No, the guy, he's still T-O-S-E of the Philadelphia Eagles. Meet me at the pool in five minutes. And he gave me the interview. And it was, you know, it was fun. You could do stuff like that back then. You can't now. Oh, there, there was a, 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 you all have them. You have relationships to this day while we're sitting here. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be enough chairs in this dining room for all the people that have changed our lives. Right. And whether they're players, owners, Equipment guys, we're lucky guys. We're, yeah, we are. You know, sports for the gift of sports. Yeah. Deuces, what's the danger of getting too close to an athlete? I know TV stations now pay athletes uh, um, to be on their team. The, the athlete or coach expects you to give them, you know, preferential t treatment or uh, I'll never forget. It was a, I, when I was working in Miami and I went to a locker room and a, a player – uh, receiver started mouthing off at me because he said that I, I said on the air that he cost them the game, and I said y you fumbled the ball twice and your team lost by like three points. You absolutely did, but I thought we were boys. I thought we were boys. That's kind of the, the danger. That's the yeah, that's the danger. Um, you know, you can have friendly relationships with them and stuff like that. I think most athletes now kind of understand. You know, we we have a job to do, and you know, but some of them have very thin skin, and some of them. Despite what you, despite what they say, when they say, "Oh, I don't, I don't listen to talk radio, or I don't read the paper, or I'm not on a, I'm reading the comments on Twitter," more yeah. of them do than don't. Yeah, human nature. It's human nature, yeah. And so some of these guys, it's like the game's done, and Coach Sirianni hasn't even given his, you know, post game speech, and they're they're on their phones <laughs> reading about what people are saying about them on, yeah. on Twitter. Well, it used but, to be – I'm sorry. That can happen yeah. anyway. You sure. know I mean? Even if a guy isn't on your payroll per se, right? Yeah. He can and still I, yell at you. I remember one time walking into the Eagles locker room and uh, Jalen Rager's dad, uh, who was a defensive lineman, said, you said we were soft. You said our defense played soft. Don't you ever say that about us. I said, uh, you saw me last night? That's right. I watched you and you said we were soft. I said – Appreciate you watching, man. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. there you go. There you go. Thanks for watching. But uh, now, now we have former – well, not just now, but it's, it's, this practice started some time ago. Former athletes who become broadcasters, right? Five Sigma Emma did a wonderful job. But by and large, it's, it's, they become analysts. And, and Joe, your, your company hires a lot of those guys. Yeah. How hard is it to get them from game mode to this is my job now? Uh, it's one of the more fascinating parts of my job is that noticing that a there's certain aspects of someone who made their livelihood as an athlete that never leave that person. Um, 
everybody I'm sure has seen Ricky Vitalico and how he gets it. That's how long it takes for him to get fired up about something that happened in the game. And it comes through in the air. Sure. Um, I work closely with Scott Hartnell and he's n only five years removed from playing. And, um, you know, the, the competitive fire is still there and it's, um, it's a slippery slope because particularly last year, like, we would do the Flyers that had a bad year, and um, Claude Giroux got traded, and Scott and Claude Giroux are friends. Mm. And it was, it was kind of to work the middle line of being able to be, to analyze as well as maintain your friendship, is something that I don't know. So it's hard to coach somebody for that. Right. And that's an ongoing thing. Um, and I know Ron Jaworski's name's come up several times, and he now works on our pre- and post-game mm -hmm. shows. Um, so I've talked with Ron a little, but he's been doing it so long. Right. He's, the, he's a pro. He, he could teach a class on how to do it. So Absolutely. Yeah, but it's definitely a uh, one of the more challenging aspects, and I, I, I say enjoyable because um, I still, once in a while, I grew up in this area, was a big fan of every team, and I still <laughs> – usually once every couple of weeks catch myself thinking if I would have told high school me that this is my, what me, yeah, my job right. would be, you know, 30, 25 years from now that, uh, I, I wouldn't have believed it. So yeah. it's, it's definitely a, uh, a very unique career, um, to be part of. Yeah. After 35 years, I just decided it was time to find something else in life. I didn't know I could ever find anything as much fun as TV. <laughs> I only loved really two things in my life growing up. Was One was baseball and one was TV. So I'd done the, the TV thing, and it was time to go to the baseball thing. And, uh, you know, this is my 18th year with the Phillies, and I still get uh, some photographers or other media members that tell me, you got out at the right time. It was fun back then. Well, I, you know, you think about it, and maybe it was. And time has a way of you only remember the good things, right, from the, what the be-gone days. But, Jeff, do you think it was more fun back there than it is now, back then than it is now? It, it's funny. Just as you said that, I thought the, the first time that I went on the road as a sports producer was 1986, and it was Buddy Ryan's first minicamp in March of 86, Ooh, Arizona. down in Tampa. Oh, now, Tampa. this is how the business has changed. Uh, uh, the talent was Joe Pellegrino, and I was the producer. We had a camera person. We shot on, I guess, three-quarter inch tape. Mm -hmm. I had to physically take those raw tapes to the airport mm -hmm. and put them on an airplane to get back to Philadelphia. Somebody from Channel 10 would pick them up at the airport, take them back, edit them, yeah. put them together. Now, you do it in five seconds. On your laptop. So in, in answer to your question, uh, it was harder. It was harder. And maybe that's what made it more fun mm -hmm. was that we didn't realize it at the time, but we didn't know that 30 years later you'd be able to do everything on your laptop and right. call it a day. And not that, it, not that it's not still a hard job, but it certainly was a lot more a lot tougher. And Lou, we could only get ready for the shows they had on, which was, they didn't care about a noon newscast for sports, but 6 and 11. Right. 5, right? 6, That's and 11, it. Yeah. Or 5 and 6 and 11. Right. Now, right. now you've got to be ready to go live w with a satellite or with your, with your with, backpack yeah, yeah. at any time. Yeah. And, and, and now if you're working the business, they can call you six, seven, eight times during the day to do a, a right. live show. Right? I wondered about that, which would have been tough. You asked about the fun part of it yeah. back in our day. Now, for those of you that don't remember, when I, I came to Channel 3 in 1986, and my team was, I was the head guy. Yuki Washington was the weekend guy. Michael Barkan was the reporter. Tom Stathakis was the producer. Jim Cuddy, he was another producer. Jim Ruling. We were all under the age of 30, and we were all single. So it was fun. <laughs> there you go. And we worked until midnight every night, and there was nothing else to do but to go over to Bridget Foy's, and we happened to be pals with a guy named Charles Barkley, who was in his rookie year with the Sixers. So there was some fun. Yeah, absolutely. And you didn't have a bad crew over there on City Line we Avenue at the time were either. We, yeah. were, we were doing fine. We were next to Fridays, so we had... <laughs> We had some place to go too. We, and remember, we Lou, when they ran those commercials with you and Yuki singing, and singing, yeah. and Michael Barkan was just like some little yeah. guy. He was like some nobody. Yeah. And, 
who asked, did you say sing? That's and that it. Was a, That's it. <laughs> that was some that great stuff. Now he's everywhere. Some yeah, great stuff. He is, he is everywhere. I'd like to open it up for questions. I'm sure you guys would like to pepper these folks uh, with some things that are on your mind. Uh, still talk about uh, the old days or current sports because we have a good you know, collection of people from, from uh, past. And I hate to say past. It feels like we all died. <laughs> we used to work in the business full time and, and, and guys uh, who are currently doing it. So uh, just stand up if you got a question. And Sachs, you must have a question. No, I was just going to say. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I noticed they had like nine cameras on a bar to shoot to shoot the game. And they, I mean, they had some cameramen, but they also had these uh, cameras that uh, they didn't need anybody for. The robotic cameras, right? A lot of the personal. I think the fun part was because there was so much personal involvement. I mean, I'd be on camera in the in the. Um, Kofax. You were Connie Mack, didn't you? Did you work in Connie Mack Stadium? Yeah. I worked there. I worked, uh, that's where I did work most of the game. We mm -hmm. did the Phillies in those days. We had the contract. Channel 6 had the contract. Yeah. Right. A little different. How many cameras did you have to cover the whole game? Four, maybe? How many cameras did you have to cover the action? First, first center field, third home base. Yeah, that's what I figured. And depending who was doing the feed, we may have a couple more cameras. Sometimes if we're feeding Canada or right. something. Right. Be a couple extra cameras, but nothing like. Joe, imagine working a game like that. Uh, no, it's uh, even. I'm just even going back to what, what the the most recent discussion here about um, traveling and how that's all changed. The first time I ever got sent on the road, it was to Dallas in 2005, which was the year, the off season before where Terrell Owens blew up everything with his contract demands, and. Uh, so I'm the field producer on site to cover the game, and T.O. was ruled out of that game, and there was kind of some question about whether he was kind of fabricating an injury or just was not really, you know, committed to playing in that game. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't talk. We talked to a bunch of guys, and I remember taking a tape. Now, I had never been in Texas in my life. Taking a tape and having to drive it from downtown Dallas to Irving where the old Cowboy Stadium was, and feed it from Fox Sports Southwest. And I'm in a rental car. I'm only two years into my career, and I'm 24 years old. And I was like, how, how did I get here? Right. And hmm. to now think that you can do that and it can be back to Philadelphia in 30 seconds is right. just – I mean, that was, only, that was what, 18 years ago now, not even 18. So it's a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. And to think that it's is so different in just that amount of time is just mind-boggling. Jeff, remember we we there was no cable in the city of Philadelphia. There's no cable, no. so we all had Everything three, six, and ten. Air. We we had it right. Yeah. yeah. But but by the same token, we couldn't. For, if the Phillies played, we had to take these big long tapes, take them over to your place. Well, spec it wasn't your place yet. It was Prism, and it was a little closet, and we had to depend on them to to put them in and, and record the game. And then I didn't have a producer or anything, so I'd work 11 sometimes, and I'd have to go back after about sixth inning. And we, if, the, if the highlight happened after the sixth inning, we didn't have it because until the next day because, you know, you still had it, but there was nobody to pick it up. How about the, the guy How about that? Uh, the guy from uh, Liberty Bell Racetrack or Brandywine Mark, Racetrack Mark, that would Mark, bring – he would Mark bring Mark the tapes, <laughs> Right? Remember that? We'd have to wait till like, 10.45 to get the tapes of the last race yeah. at the racetrack, and we'd air the, the last 10 seconds of the race yeah. or whatever. Or so. you hear from them the next day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my, my, uh, we were just talking about getting tapes and what, what going on trips. My, my favorite story, and I'll make it very brief, we were at uh, – Channel 10 was at the Rose Bowl when Penn State played Oregon in 1996. And we were there for the whole week. And the reason we were there is because of the football game. So the day of the game, uh, we were late getting to the stadium because the Rose Bowl parade literally takes up 10 miles. So we had to go all the way around. We finally get to the Rose Bowl for the game. And we're upstairs having lunch. And my cameraman said, we better get down to the field. The game starts in 15 minutes. I said, we have plenty of time. 
We finally get down to the field. We're walking out to the stadium, uh, to, the, to the field at the stadium, and 100,000 people are yelling. The first play of the game, Kijana Carter goes 80 yards for a touchdown, and he's standing there with a the camera in his arm. Close. What would you do? I got the tape from the CBS affiliate in Portland. But stuff like that, yeah. you know, you never hear about things like that. But that, that scared me to death, and, and luckily we found a way to get around it. But, but we always work together. We the always work, work together. We always work together. And, you if know, you were in a bad spot, me, he could be in a bad spot tomorrow and right. he'd help me. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. Lou would have given me his tape. Yeah. No. no, he wouldn't have. No, he wouldn't. <laughs> Next question? We have no ratings. Yes. <laughs> Right. Uh huh. Ooh. Yeah. I think you got to get it right. I think that's the, the it's most number one thing. But you're taking away the human element. Yeah. So like, I know the minor leagues are doing the, you know, they're going to do the robot you know, mm -hmm. to call the balls and strikes. I, I would like, like you, Scott. I grew up on baseball. I. If it was up to me, there, there'd be no wild card. You know what I mean? Like, hey, yeah. you, gotta, you play 162 games, you, you, you know. You, you win the American fight. League, <laughs> yeah, you win the National exactly. League, you play in the World Series. Yeah. Damn it, that's what you do. So the human element, I, I you know, I, I kind of like the every umpire has a different yeah. strike zone and the umpire, I and mean, the players got to, you know, know, know who's back there. But the number one thing is to, to get it right. And now with gambling has changed everything. Yeah, we could get it's, into that. Yeah, and because gambling is such a big part of it, I think the fans want them to get it right. I mean, like, yeah, it's true. You know, so I, I think instant replay is a, a overall good thing. Deuce, as we promised, we would get you out of here because you have some place to go. Yeah. Unlike the rest of us, who <laughs> I, I, I do want to maybe I, looking for a soft pretzel on a corner soon. <laughs> oh, when Joe was talking about like if he could tell his younger, you know, self, you know, about being being somewhere. Um, I try to remain in the moment. You know, I've had some cool things happen, but sometimes you don't realize how cool it is. You know, I, I got to go to Japan many years ago with the Yankees when I worked in New York. And, it, you know, you're just literally sitting there like, oh, my gosh, I'm on the other side of the world watching baseball. Right. You know what I mean? I had a really cool moment during the Phillies um, World Series run a few months ago. Um, I was supposed to go visit my mom in Chicago. Um, I was supposed to take the whole family there. And as the Phillies are winning, it was looking like things might have to get changed. And I, I think we were – I was in Atlanta or maybe it was in St. Louis. And I was doing an interview with Kyle Schwarber. And we get done, and we're just kind of just shooting the breeze afterwards. And he uh, he played with the Cubs, and I'm originally from Chicago. And so I was like, hey, where'd you live in Chicago? Oh, I'm from Chicago. Just did BS. And, and I, I say to him, I was like, yeah, I'm like, ah, I'm supposed to go um, I'm supposed to go back to Chicago. He asked me how often I go back home. I'm like, ah, it's been a while. I'm like, actually, I'm supposed to go see my mom for the first time in two years. I go, but it kind of really depends on, you know, what you guys do. He goes, between you and me, I hope you don't get to see your mom anytime soon. <laughs> I was like, but it was cool. And it was like, honest. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, you know, that's pretty cool. And actually, I texted my mom. That, you know, I'm like, hey, this player, and my mom doesn't want really fall sports, but I'm like, hey, it's one of the guys who was on the Cubs when they won the World Series. He told me this, and my mom goes, well, next time you see him, you tell him to get that trophy. And I was, oh, like, nice. I was, like, it was like, it was just, and like, wow, like, how cool is that? You know, I mean, I'm just BS with the player, right. you know. And like sometimes I, you, know, you forget, you know, you're at the World Series, you're at the Super Bowl, and just take a moment to sit back and like, wow, this is take it all in. Yeah, and you're getting paid to do it too. Yeah, you know? not a bad deal. Deuces, thank you for thank coming you with so us. Much. Thank Appreciate you so much. Thank you for having me. Deuces, Rogers, everybody. <laughs> Any other questions? Not for Deuces since he's out of the room. What about some Chicago? They're talking, oh, they're talking We just found out we're neighbors <laughs> from back in Chicago days. Uh, I don't want to, you know, have you guys leave without having a chance to ask a question. Yes, I'll, I'll, well, at least just waving at deuces. <laughs> Faked me out. Yeah. No? Okay. Then I want to I talk about uh, the rules changes uh, in all sports, really. Uh, and, well, let's start with baseball because that's coming up most, uh, you know, in just a month or so. Every rule change is made with the fan in mind. Right now, baseball is very slow. You can't keep somebody's eyeballs for three and a half hours. So we're going to speed the game up. But then you get the purists who say, it's, you know, it's not like it used to be. What, what do you guys think about that? I mean, there's a, you know, the whole thing of, eh, you know, it wasn't the way it was when I was young. Well, guess what? Nothing else is the way when we were young. And the, why we think it was good when we were young? Because we were young. 
We didn't wake up in the morning with aches and pains. You know, we had something place to go and some people to see and some reason to go there. But no, nobody wants to watch a batter walk out of the box, kick the dirt eight times, scratch himself seven times, spit five times, and then get back in the box. So you can cut all that out. That's just fat. So yeah, I love putting clocks on it and saying you have this much time to pitch, you have this much time to get in the batter's box. So I think those are good changes. Okay, I do, I do too, as a matter of fact. And remember back in the day, Steve Carlton used to pitch in an hour and 55 minutes. Mm -hmm. An it's hour, tops, and right? Tops, when he, put, when he pitched against Gibson, sometimes it was yeah. an hour and a half. Yeah. 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 And yeah. obviously there's more commercial time, but still there's not an hour and a half more commercial time. So, right. yeah, I'm in favor of speeding up. I, I don't get this make the bag bigger. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't like that at all. To, you know, so to increase people's chances of sliding in safe to second or third base, they're making the bag bigger. All right, probably. I'll give you something you probably haven't thought of. This came from Derek Hall. I spent last week with him. He was one of the Name players dropper. we took. I know. We went to Jamaica. <laughs> how, how bad is that? My job is I had to take 80 fans to Jamaica for a week in Montego uh, Bay. So we're, we're, I'm talking to Derek, who's a wonderful young guy, by the way. He said, something you haven't thought about? We are big people now. Have you watched? I mean, have you watched a baseball team come in anymore? I mean, through the tunnel, have you just watched them? No. It looks like an NBA team. Really? My God, there's, you know, every once in a while you get a Mookie Betts or somebody, but they're all 6'5". Mm -hmm. So first baseman corner uh, infielders are usually big. So he said, um, I'm really looking forward to the big bag because, for one, I'll have less chance of getting spiked with the runner coming down mm -hmm. to first base. Mm -hmm. so I got the inside of the bag. He's got the outside. There's a little more time. He said, but otherwise, uh, there's a battle for that bag. And with two big guys, you need a little space. So for that, just for that point, I never thought about it from first baseman's view. But yeah, it is, it is supposed to increase the running game. But what's going to really increase the running game is only two throws over to first, mm. and the next one's a balk, and the guy mm. goes to second base. I can't wait to see how that players is Players received. are faster, so they're not going to increase it from 90 feet to 100 feet. I, don't know, I guess but, I am But a couple school. of inches yeah. can make a difference. Yeah. A lot of bang-bang plays. You know what, Scott, in baseball, I think a couple things. One, we were talking about instant replay. The bag's being bigger. I, I can't stand when the guys slide past the bag a little bit, and right. now everybody's looking for the tag after they slide yeah. back. Yeah. That is not why instant replay No, is there. it wasn't why it was, but they had to do it, because now we have well, evidence. Yeah. The guy but was not I touching the, the bag, bag at that millisecond. Bigger, yeah, the bag being bigger might cut down on that a little Maybe. bit. Maybe. And also, I just think, I do think that the overwhelming amount of numbers that are available now to some older, and I mean, I'm, I'm 42, so I'm not, like, I have been watching baseball since the 80s. Um, but the n numbers make it boring. Yeah. And, you know, to me, any stat that starts with the word expected, I'm not interested in. <laughs> but there's, Good. that's all you hear about in right. every sport now. Well, Jim um, Murray, we have, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Joe. You were still finishing. No, no, I'm just saying, like, th that is... You know, I got in an argument with one of the guys that covers the Flyers a couple of years ago because, you know, he started saying, well, the expected goals in this game was this. And I'm like, but how many goals, how many actual goals were scored? Does it matter what was expected? Yeah. You know, I get that it sort of shows how a team is playing, but come on. Yeah. Analytics has, has um, entered into every single sport, college, professional, mm -hmm. probably high school. I don't know. Jimmy, are we relying too much on analytics and, and, and neglecting the human part of the game? No, I think because you get back to it, there's so much technology now right. that you ask questions or see things that you would have never seen in the good old days at Shy Park or, yeah. you know, places like that. But what's Even in good, football, other sports, I mean, yeah. it's all analytics now. Well, what's good is what Jackie and the people that remember when have done. Because what you're talking about is when we grew up and how you played – your first, hey, I'm an Eddie Juice guy from the A's and the mm -hmm. first thing. I, you know, I, I think sports has changed the world a little bit, but sports haven't changed. It's still, hey, get up there, give 100%. Well, that's yeah. why we watch. You, you yeah. still don't know how the, how the story is going to end, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but one thing about analytics where it comes to football, and that's, that's always been my prime sport, um, is, is, is you can tell from analytics how often on fourth and one from inside the five-yard line it's worth to go. But what you can't tell from those analytics is whether your right guard is kicking the crap out of the nose guard on a regular basis. And somebody's got to be watching the game to know how to make right. that decision. 
Because right. some analytics based on last week's game with another guard you know, playing another man isn't going to apply. That's where it really bothers me in that sport more than, more than other. And the other sport where I think it's hurt my interest as a fan is NBA basketball. And it's like home run derby with the threes. Mm -hmm. With the threes. My God, I'm bored to death. I, I hated I the three-point play because yeah. who's to say that it's harder to hit a wide-open three than it is to get the ball down low and have two guys on top of you and score two points. If they would just put Joel Embiid under the basket, whatever <laughs> they do, he scores 40 points, but he's outside shooting three all day. I don't, I don't get it. By the way, but, Bill, Billy V, you can read his opinions, I told you so, every day on his Facebook page, and I do. <laughs> nice. Well, thank, you, thank you, Lou. I just want, and let me say this too, Scott. The Phillies um, signing of Trey Turner, the best free agent possible out there, not named Aaron Judge, um, just a, an amazing – I mean, yeah. clearly it's a franchise that wants to win. Well, and it's an Trey owner, Turner, first of all, who Trey wants Turner to Trey Turner was the best possible player yeah, they no could question. possibly have signed. He's going to be so good, and he'll, he'll take Bryce's place for a half a year as far as offensive production. But what you have with the Phillies now, you, ha you have an owner who – wants his frickin' trophy back right. and, and is doing everything he can. And you have a general ma president of baseball operations who is used to spending other people's money. And more than that, he spends it well. Okay? So you got those two things together. And then you got a manager who understands the game. All managers understand the game. But he understands people. And, and when he went in and you know, replaced Girardi, there was a relaxation without – don't use relaxation in the wrong word. They were comfortable in the clubhouse. When they got on the field, they were ready to play. But they were comfortable in the clubhouse because one, one thing about Rob Thompson, he's the same every day, which is the same as Charlie Manuel was. Mm -hmm. Charlie Manuel would treat the, the, his players the same if they went 4 for 4 or 0 for 4 because he knew how hard the game was. He would you know, hit them with a nickname and move on. And, and that's, that's Rob Thompson. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think it's going to be a fun year. Uh, because I think the pieces are in place. But everybody else is getting better, too. So, you know, I, I, I don't know how the sport's going to survive, though, with all of the small market teams that don't have that cash. Right. You know, are they just going to be like the Washington Generals, you know, playing the Harold Globetrotters? Are they just going to be this week's opponent? You know, you can, you can, those teams can still win because anybody can win on a given day. But if you don't have the horses, it's pretty tough, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we should have a good – a good year coming up, and uh, I never saw anything, and I've been in town since 81, I never saw any crowd react like, like the Phillies crowd did during the playoffs. No. And honestly, that's why a couple of free agents came here. They, they, they cited two things. They cited the fans, and they cited the players having fun, and they wanted to go back where it was fun to play the game again because it is a kid's game. Mm -hmm. But, man, anybody who thinks baseball is easy, it is not right. easy at all, not even one little bit. So. You know, I think we have some good players. We have management in place that wants to win, and we got fans who can't wait to see if we can do it all over again. So I think I think it'll be a good year. Uh, anything else before we leave here? I want to thank baseball for saving my life. I met Diane when we both worked for the Atlanta Crackers. Oh, wow. And we actually won the World Series. So uh, baseball and sports, as I look around this room, every person here, has been changed by sports mm -hmm. and it's a powerful powerful thing and i just appreciate letting us come and say no, a few things so glad to see you jimmy always and the one thing about sports and why the rates go so high in cable to keep tuning in it's the one thing you can't dvr you can't record it you can record it and watch it later but you got to be there when it happens right. you've got to see what's happening while it's happening in, in the same time frame steve do you have something Oh, Lewis, you've had some experience in that. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about the live golf and the, reason the controversy? That I, the reason I continued to be, and it might have been my favorite sport to watch in the new era, because as I always say, if you don't put it in the cup, you don't get paid. That's what made me interested in watching any kind of competitive golf. So as a fan, I entirely turned off against the guaranteed salaries and then the big prizes on top of that. doesn't interest me. That's, that's just where I am. So I, they'll lose people like you. Yeah, they'll lose people like me. I miss uh, Jim's tournament in, uh, 
in Wilmington, the LPGA. Yeah, yeah. how about that? Yeah, yeah. You McDonald's. still love to cover that. Yeah. You guys were so gracious. You made all the, the women available to interview for us. It was, it was the best. I forgot about that. I yeah. appreciate you yeah. saying that because Herbie Lotman, who's in heaven Her. now, yeah. putting that, that, that ladies golf on, it was one of the best parts of my life. Oh, just that's the, the best. That's great. Because the players themselves yeah. were present to it. Yep. So Betsy just passed away too. Yeah, right? that yeah. just broke my heart. Yeah. yeah. Again, what Sorry. you're hearing here is, and again, I, I mentioned Baltimore, Boston, New York. It's not like this in all the other cities where there's this fraternity of guys. Now, like with Jeff and Scott, we haven't seen each other in a long time. Yeah. But we can pick right back up. Yeah. Two or seconds. Joe and Billy V right. and Jimmy. I see at mass every week. So. <laughs> well, last time when I saw Jim at the uh, last uh, broadcast Pioneers induction. I went up to him and I said, Jim, I love you, man. And he said, I love your wife. <laughs> so. I thought you were going to say you saw him at the Last Supper. I didn't know. I mean, the man's got connections. He could have been anywhere. Jackie, thank you. Wherever you're sitting. Oh, there you are. Thank you for bringing us all together. It was fun going down memory lane. And thank you all for listening. Uh, we've had a blast. It's just fun catching up with my friends again. So thank you very much for inviting us. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.